So here we are now in uh, part five of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And Paul wrote this letter in 57 AD-ish. We don't know the exact date, but they would assume that it's somewhere in that area. And he was in Ephesus when he wrote it. So he had already traveled through Corinth a few times. This is actually on his third journey that he wrote this, this letter. And in the letter, he had to address a lot of issues with a body of uh, believers who he once shared a lot of deep time with spiritually and was just blessed to see how the Holy Spirit was moving when he was there. Now he's heard many things that have disturbed him because just in any of our lives, how easy it is for us to um, be distracted if we're distracted long enough, then we we come off the tracks. And if we are no longer following Jesus, we're following something else. And that's what was happening in Corinth, was there was a whole lot of um, believers who uh, weren't trusting in the Spirit and weren't following Jesus. They had grown to follow other things, other people, other voices. And so as we go through this, Paul's now going to address a whole new issue that is significant because today is probably the most confusing topic for people who really aren't trusting in the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line. If you trust in the Holy Spirit, then these chapters make perfect sense and they actually are a blessing. But if you're not really trusting in the Holy Spirit in your life, these chapters present a whole lot of information that people fight and argue and separate and divide themselves because of. So let's go ahead and begin in chapter 12 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And he says, now about spiritual gifts, just just by the, the nature of what he said, spiritual gifts, these are spiritual. This is not human. This is not what we feel out of our emotion. This is purely from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus who lives within us. These spiritual gifts are given to us according to God, how he wants things put together. And that's what Paul's going to address here. He says, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to understand about spiritual gifts. You know that when you were pagans, non-believers, or when you were following something other than Jesus, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I inform you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord. From their heart, they can't say this, except by the Holy Spirit. And now he goes in, he says, there are different gifts. But you know what? There's the same spirit. The gifts don't come from us. We don't get to pick and choose them off of a a fruit tree and say, this is the one I would like. Let me go ahead and use this one today. So this is number one why the gifts of the spirit are so confusing, because people think they can pick and choose what gifts they want God to give them. And then they go out and exploit that, thinking that this is truly from God. And it may not be. So we have to understand what these gifts really are before we can understand really what they're not. So these gifts are from the same spirit. Now there are different ministries, but the same Lord. We all have different ministries that we're performing. Uh, Whether we're in Indonesia or California or in Montana, or if we're in Florida, wherever we are in the world, and wherever we are in the body of Christ, the body, We know that the Lord will use us and he blesses us with the ministry and the gifts to perform that ministry. We don't pick and choose that. That's not something that we say, okay, Lord, I think today I like this or I want to do that. We say, Lord, what would you have of me today? And that's what Paul needed to really hammer home with these folks. And he said, you know, there are different ways of working but the same God works all things in all people. Once again, points it to God. It's not what we do, it's what God is doing. Now to each one, 
the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Early on, you have to just get this. Paul said this, and he's going to say it over and over again. It's not for you. It's not about us. It's the common good. It's about how the body, how we together operate, how we together learn, how we together encourage and love one another. That's what Paul is addressing. What had happened in Corinth was everybody became singular. Oh, it's all about me and I have this gift and, and oh, you don't have that gift. And they started dividing themselves based on what gifts they had. And then they were so confused, they were like children. They didn't understand anything from a, a depth of spiritual understanding. They only understood it from a human aspect. And humans can't understand the mind of God. That truly comes from the spirit. So he goes on, he says, to one there is given through the spirit, the message of wisdom. It comes from the spirit. To another, the message of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. And to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in various tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of those tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, not us. It's not us who's doing this work. All of these are one and the same from the Spirit who apportions to each person as he determines, not as we determine. Now, I'll go on and, and share a little bit more depth on this just so you have a better understanding. There are times in my life in Christ that the Lord has used me for physical healing of people. There are other times where he's giving me a prophetic word. There are other times where he's actually given me a word of knowledge. And yet all of those were just because he gifted that to me and apportioned it according to what he willed, because that was part of what he was ministering through me to someone else. This is the way we need to understand how the spirit works. Now, there are many, many churches all around the world that are teaching a whole nother dialect, a whole nother understanding, a whole nother doctrine that is not what Paul's talking about here. One that divides and one that causes people to become puffed up. One that causes people to feel they might be better than someone else and even worse, that it causes some people to feel like they're less than someone else. All of this, Paul is trying to put to bed in this chapter. He says the body is a unit. He's talking about our human body. Our body is a unit. We have fingers and toes and nose and ears and eyes. Our body is a unit, though it is composed of many parts, as I just mentioned. And although its parts are many, they all form one body. So think about your body. Your body looks a lot like somebody else's body, but your body is no better or no worse. But think about how your body is put together. Can you really do without parts of your body? Well, intentionally, we don't do this, nor does Christ do this. And with that understanding, we'll start to understand more about what Paul's talking about when he talks about the body of Christ. And so he says, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit, we were all placed into one body, baptized, that Greek word baptismo means that we were placed into the body of Christ, which is the living church. So we were placed into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink, that one spirit dwells within every person who's truly been born again, transformed, and is in the body of Christ. For the body does not consist of one part. There is not just a finger or just a, a mind or a head or a toe. The body, in fact, it, it consists of many parts. And so if the foot should say, hey, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I 
do not belong to the body. That wouldn't make it any less part of the body either. So if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the members of the body, that's us who are in Christ, every one of them according to his design. We cannot step in God's way. Paul's telling them this because they were doing this. They were in discord. They were superseding what the Spirit was trying to do in their lives, trying to do it on their own and following their own teachings, and they were confused, and they needed the discipline that Paul was giving them. He says, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body, one church. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you either. Nor can the head say to the feet, I don't need you. We all need one another. That's the beauty of what Paul is saying. And that's with us sharing here now. We all need one another because that's the way that God has arranged it. That is God's purpose. On the contrary, Paul says, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, well, they're indispensable. And the parts we consider less honorable, well, we treat with greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with special modesty, whereas our presentable parts have no such need. But God has composed the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be what? No division in the body. It's not what we find around the world today. And that's not what Paul was writing to right here in Corinth. He said there should be no division in the body because we are all equal in the body. But that its members should have a mutual concern for what? One another. Not for themselves, but for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a member of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then workers of miracles, and those with gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various tongues. But are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Hmm. But eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now we have to consider what are the greater gifts? He just gave us a whole line of different gifts. What are the greater gifts? He says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. You want the greater gifts? He says, I will show you the most excellent way. And so in chapter 13, he says, you know, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. So if you're wondering what this means, well, speaking in tongues is a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. And whether you do or do not speak with tongues doesn't make you more or less than anyone. But if you do speak with the tongues of angels and you don't have love, then that nullifies any gift that you might have had at all. Because love is the key. You're just a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, that would be an awesome thing. And if I have absolute faith, so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. This is the better way that we love. We put others in front of ourselves. If I give all my that I possess to the poor and I exult in the surrender of my body, but if I don't have love, I've gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It is not rude. It does not 
seek for itself. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure, no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things and hopes all things, endures all things. Yes, in fact, love never fails. But where there is prophecy, they'll cease. Where there's tongues, well, they'll be restrained. Where there is knowledge, it will be dismissed. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. Well, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, an adult, I set aside childish ways. Now we see but a dim reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Our lives in Christ are based on that. Our faith, our hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So Paul gives them a better way. And then in chapter 14, he continues saying, therefore earnestly pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, but only if they will be used in the love of Christ, especially the gift of prophecy. Why? Well, he's going to let us know. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So yes, you may speak in a tongue, but you're not speaking to men. You're speaking to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. But he who prophesies, well, he's speaking to men for their edification, their encouragement, and comfort. Now, the one who speaks in a tongue, hey, they edify themselves. But the one who prophesies, they do the common good thing. They edify the body of Christ, the church. I wish that all of you could speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. Now, he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church, the body, the believers can be edified once again, it's for the common good. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even in the case of lifeless instruments, such as a flute or a harp, how will anyone recognize the tune they are playing unless the notes are distinct, unless they can understand them? Again, if the trumpet sounds a muffled call, who will prepare for battle? Well, I didn't know what that was. Did anybody get that? And so Paul's giving us a great example of here of how people could become selfish and try and not even properly use a gift from God. So it is with you, he says, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will be just speaking into the air. Assuredly, there are many different languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of someone's language, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. It is the same with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, because Paul knew they were, since you are so eager to have these spiritual gifts, he said, strive to excel in the gifts that do what? Build up the church, the body. Therefore, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he might interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What then shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Otherwise, if you speak a blessing in the spirit, how can someone who is uninstructed say amen to your thanksgiving says he does not know what you're saying you may be giving thanks well enough but the other is not edified 
I thank God that I speak tongues more than all of you. But in the church, when we're gathered, when we're meeting together and the Holy Spirit's moving during Koinonia, I would rather speak five coherent words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children, like you have a toy that you can play with. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be mature. It is written in the law by strange tongues and foreign lips, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are for a sign, not for believers, not for you to impress someone else that you can speak in tongues, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. Why? So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who are uninstructed or some unbelievers come in, they'll think you're out of your mind. They'll think, what, listen to these people babbling. But if an unbeliever or an uninstructed person comes in while everyone is prophesying, well, he'll be convicted and called to account by all and the secrets of his heart will be made known. So he will fall on his face and worship God, proclaiming God is truly among you. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a psalm or a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these things must be done for one reason, to build up the church. When you meet for koinonia, it's not for you, but it's allowing the Holy Spirit to use each one of us as we go around and share to build one another up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak in turn and someone must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he should remain silent in the church and speak only to himself and to God. Now two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said and if a revelation comes to someone who is seated, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone might be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So therefore, there is a control factor in there that God has put in because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. For God is not a God of disorder. We're not just going to sit here and babble and everyone's going to go out of control because we serve Christ and we take on the mind of Christ. But he's given us a spirit of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Now, these next few lines are disturbing for many people. But remember, there was a lot going on in the church in Corinth and the women were dominating the conversation there. And the women were actually not listening, and they were argumentative. So Paul addresses that, and he says women are to be silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they wish to inquire about something, they are to ask their own husbands at home, for it's dishonorable for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only one who it reaches? If anyone considers himself a prophet or a spiritual person, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, he himself will be ignored. So my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything must be done in a proper and orderly manner. So what we take from this, Paul is saying that as we meet in Christ, all things must be done in order. And so for those of you who are here who are women, don't be alarmed because when we share koinonia, the Holy Spirit gives each of us an opportunity to share with one another. But if we reach discord, then I think the Holy Spirit will have a different plan. But right now, when you're following Christ, Follow what the Spirit is telling you. If you feel as though he's blessed you with a, a certain gift, 
Make sure that the spirit is in control. Make sure that you are honoring God and that you are seeking to be edifying to those who you meet with, those who you gather with. And that is what Paul was talking about, addressing the spiritual gifts that were being misused, abused, and confused in the believers that were in Corinth. And that was part five of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians.